as you can see, we're actually in the middle of um, a green field, fairly nondescript green field, with development along the edge of the field. But if you look here, on the very edge of development, we have major archaeological remains. Should these remains, the remains of this nature, be found within a development site, this can pose a major risk to the client, not simply in financial terms, but also in terms of delays to construction programs and earth moving programs. It's therefore very important that at an early stage, any developer considers archaeology. Archaeology, by its very nature, is unpredictable. You never know what's there until you start peeling the ground back. Today we are on a research excavation which has actually been funded by a heritage lottery fund. However, the point is that the same kind of remains as you see here could be present within a commercial development site. Archaeology is indiscriminate. You never know where it might be. Like many British towns, Papcastle owes its very existence to the expansion of the Roman Empire. By the early 1st century, the Roman Empire expanded from Judea in the east, Spain in the west, and as far north as what we now call Holland. But the dark and dank islands on the northwest corner of Europe still lay beyond them. And bringing the British Isles into the Empire was a task the Emperor Claudius set himself. And in AD 43, the legions marched. But even the mighty Romans found Britain no pushover, and enemies were found everywhere. Although successful in the south, at the end of stretched supply lines, the Romans consistently failed to subdue Caledonia. Finally, eight years after the initial conquest itself, the Emperor Hadrian ordered the construction of a series of fortifications joined by a large wall, stretching from the North Sea to the Irish Sea. This fortification, bearing his name, is still in existence today and formed the northern boundary of the greatest empire in history. The significance of Pap Castle comes down to the phasing of Roman occupation. The Romans didn't send soldiers where they weren't going to be useful. Once those soldiers had arrived, they went firm in the form of a small marching fort, which then became larger and larger as the garrison grew. This area was well established. They exploited this area. They then brought in the logistics required to keep their troops occupied, to keep them supplied to get them moving around. In other words, they gave them tactical and strategic mobility. At the same time, what this did was it encouraged trade. Trade in the form of the little things that a soldier can't get from the army. The wine that he needed when he was off duty. The things like small gods and votive offerings that he could buy from uh, street hawkers if there's a street there. And all of the little comforts he's unlikely to actually get from other soldiers. A squaddy and his wages are really easily parted. And this, what we see in the phasing of this settlement of Pap Castle, is the way that it went from a small fort in Dewentio to becoming a boom town based on squaddies and based on the Roman occupation of northern England. the um, eastern side of the Roman town at Papcastle, which we've been excavating over the last three seasons as part of a community archaeology project. And um, the aims of this has been to basically put Papcastle in its context in the 
northern frontier zone of the Roman Empire. Um, very little work has ever been done on Papcastle until we started this project three years ago. And since we've been working on it, we've found an amphitheater, two bathhouses, a mansio, um, the civilian suburbs on the other side of the River Derwent. So the site has grown from basically just a fort to a large town. And we're trying to tell the story of this town and thinking of it more as the administrative capital of the sort of western region of um, the northern frontier zone. We've Carlisle in the centre, Corbridge in the east, we've now got Pat Castle in the west. The position of the town is really important because you've got the River Derwent that we now think was navigable to Maryport on the coast. We've got three roads joining, so you, you think the place is a transport hub almost. You've got roads going through the Lake District to Keswick, you've got roads going to Maryport, to um, Hadrian's Wall at Bruff, and also to Carlisle, which is the road we've been excavating on this excavation this season. Um, what you can see in front of you is part of the actual civilian settlement. The fort is a scheduled ancient monument, so all our research has focused on everything other than the fort. So we're basically telling the story of the town. What we see here is the um, retaining wall of the terrace that was constructed by the Roman military for this road surface. You can just see in the corner of our trench we've clipped the Roman road. This would have been the main Roman road to Carlisle, the motorway system of its day. I'm now stood on the Roman road. You can see below me here we've got the curbing and to my right here we've got the actual Roman cobbled surface. You can still actually see the camber of the road. Um, it's been disturbed here by a utility trench. Off the main road, we've got plots, which you could think of as burgage plots in a medieval town. Narrow end onto the road, long narrow plots heading off. So we've got a plot here that would have had a timber building. We've found things such as post holes, halves, pits, which have defined this area. I'm now stood on the T-junction with a minor road running off the main street, which we could call the High Street. So this is a side road, which has been really well made. And as you can see in front of me, there's been numerous phases of road surface. Um, the earliest surface made out of quite substantial river cobbles. I'm stood within what we believe to be a shop fronting the main High Street. The doorway right in front of me. The back wall just there behind me. Um, with a workshop to the rear that would have been accessed through a little side alley to my right. I'm stood within the workshop to the rear of the shop I was just showing you. We've got these really nice internal features surviving this building including these internal partitions and what we think is the forge in the central part of this building with um, a hearth in front of me, a small flue there and what we think here is a possible base for a hammerstone or anvil. This area here has had quite a lot of burning. You can see the, the colour changes, the, the orange where the heat transfer has fired the clay, partially fired the underlying clay. The areas of black, uh, bright orange indicate burning. We don't know if this is domestic or industrial activity, perhaps small scale industry, blacksmithing. And, um, and we can see here the colour change indicates that it's been burning around this area of stones, perhaps a hearth. So we're taking an environmental sample and that will, once it's processed, reveal evidence of food waste, perhaps cooking. Um, alternatively, it may reveal some magnetic material. If the site's been used as a forge for blacksmithing, small particles of, of metal called hammer scale will come off during that process and when the soil is, is washed 
uh, we can look for this hammer scale and that could give us evidence of function in this area. The Romans were famous for their civil engineering and here we've got a beautiful example of a Roman drain that has survived in this section. The further we go down the site, the more damage it's been by modern ploughing, which again shows how vulnerable and fragile archaeological remains are. The open air excavation of the workshops hasn't been the only archaeology occurring this year. Further to the west, a rectilinear trench was placed which has revealed some quite interesting archaeology. So what we've got here is the revetment for the south side of the road. Um, that holds back the road effectively because it's in big stone slabs with stones across the top and then there's cobbles on the on the top of the surface but at the side of this was this massive ditch that comes out to here and at a later phase they probably built this structure here which has got massive cobbles at the bottom and then the big stones on top our first thinking was that this was another phase of revetment for the road, but now we're thinking it may be the front face of a building actually built alongside the road. Um, good evidence for that has been uncovered this morning in that we've got a Roman roof tile. On the other area of the site all we've got is slates, so this is a high status artifact. And we're getting some really nice pottery out of here, black burnished ware. Um, so we think this is an area that's been upgraded at a later date, but we've yet to uncover what's going on. Of great significance is the road surface itself. I'm standing on the Roman road and you can see the curbing beneath me, which lines up with the curbing we found in the main area. We're hoping this road to lead on to the river crossing across the River Derwent, which we hope to find next year. The Geophysical Survey not only gives an indication of what archaeology may be under the uh, ground prior to excavation, it also forms part of the archaeological record of the site itself. All features, finds and fills are very, very stringently and accurately recorded. All archaeological contexts on a site are measured with reference to both vertical elevation and horizontal coordinates, the aim being to provide a three-dimensional plan of the overall archaeology of the site. These one meter squares with their 20 centimeter subdivisions can be seen here being used by Dave Jackson, the site supervisor, to provide a plan at one to five. The accuracy of this plan is important because it forms part of the post-excavation publications and thus part of the National Archive. The required level of accuracy can be seen in previous reports from Pat Castle. The need for this accuracy is quite simple. Should the archaeology need to be removed, this is the last time we'll ever have the chance to study this human interaction with the historic environment. Some things, though, do remain. An important part of any excavation is the work we do on the finds we get from these sites. The finds allow us to date levels, to build together phasing sequences of activity. They also allow us to look into people's lives, um, their beliefs, what they were eating, were they making the pottery here, were they importing the pottery, is this a posh house or are these just poor people living on the edge of society. All this information you can get from looking at the finds and on this table here we've just got a nice variety of things we found from this work from a millstone for producing your own flour part of amphora that would have come from Spain with wine or fish sauce, a mortarium which was for producing sauces, it's almost like a modern day food processor, amphora handle, Samian pottery from Gaul which would have been your Sunday best pottery and some beautiful bits of um, Roman glass.
One of my personal favourite finds from this excavation is this small pipe clay statuette of Venus. The illustration behind it is another one we found on another excavation in the north of England. You never find a complete one. Um, it's the goddess Venus who was for prosperity and fertility and um, you always like to think they were snapped off if um, your family may have been getting a bit too fertile and um, no more kids were needed. You would snap your little statuette and bury it. Um, that's just my thought, but um, it's a nice one. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you have enjoyed the first of our mini documentaries. We hope that you've found it informative, whether you are a member of the general public with an interest in archaeology, or whether you are a developer who has to deal with archaeology on a development site. And we very much hope that you'll be joining us for the next of our mini documentaries, which we hope to bring to you in a month's time. Thank you for watching.